Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on this Monday night. I'm Brianna Venosi and it is great to be back with you following my maternity leave. Well, we begin our coverage in Trenton where the first full week of April means we are in the full swing of budget season. And after collecting public input on the state's massive $49 billion spending plan, lawmakers today heard from the state treasurer and the nonpartisan Office of Legislative Services, two influential voices. Both say New Jersey once again finds itself flush with cash. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. For state revenues, as with the overall economy, federal, uh, fiscal year 2022 was a boom year. Fiscal experts told New Jersey's Assembly Budget Committee that a red-hot recovering economy fired up state tax revenues even more than anticipated, a remarkable surge in spending power coming on the heels of the pandemic. New Jersey's treasurer says it's blown out prior estimates. We have increased the FY22 forecasts for most of the major revenues. All of these increases reflect the strong economy, job growth, wage and salary increases, consumer spending, the hot housing market, rising stock markets, and elevated corporate profits. In FY22, revenues have been beating expectations by wide margins. Officials from New Jersey's nonpartisan Office of Legislative Services said the Treasurer's revised revenue forecast is almost 11 percent more than originally calculated last June, and that OLS revised figures look even rosier at 14 percent, and estimates could still rise. There's a substantial difference between the OLS and executive forecasts, totaling more than $3.2 billion over the two years. Although large, this sort of discrepancy should not be just surprising in the context of our unusual fiscal times. But Governor Murphy's proposed $49 billion budget would actually spend more than revenues bring in, relying on a massive surplus to help keep it balanced. Murphy's budget would make another full $6.88 billion payment to the public pension fund, boost school aid by $650 million, and make a debt reduction payment of $1.3 billion. OLS warned. A budget that relies on $1.7 billion in surplus to be balanced is not sustainable in the long run when the surplus is 4.6 billion. Maybe revenue growth will continue to surprise us and will close or at least considerably narrow the gap. We're setting a budget for the next year based on um, these numbers and these no we don't know what these numbers are. What my concern is that we're spending more than we're going to take in. The state will have a better idea of revenue figures when taxes are filed in April, but officials predict that this wild revenue ride will be coming to an end looking ahead to 2023 and beyond. The overall economy is expected to cool down and rising inflation and the war in Ukraine could also impact revenues. As much as we should proud of the uh, upgrades and, and the overall budget system, and there's a lot of money this year. we got to be careful. Meanwhile, Republicans would like to see more of this boom time cash return directly to taxpayers. State revenues are above and beyond expectations. We're flush with cash. Why don't we cut tax rates for the middle class to put money directly into pockets of the people who earn it instead of spending it? Hearings will continue over the next few weeks. The state budget deadline, June 30th. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Well, is it a cancer cluster or a coincidence? A Colonia High School graduate is on a mission to answer that question after discovering more than 80 alum from the Woodbridge Township School developed the same rare brain tumor and graduated between the years of 1975 to 1995. The man leading the charge believes there's a link between Colonia High and the dozens of brain cancer cases. Joanna Gagas has the story. I was diagnosed in 99 um, at the ripe old age of 27 with a very rare, very large 
primary brain tumor. The doctor explained to me that even though these are rare, I was rare within rare. And that's because of the speed at which Al Lupiano's tumor grew. But fast forward to 2021, and rare became a word he'd get all too used to. His wife and sister were also diagnosed with rare brain tumors on the same day. He said the oncologist was stunned. He says the three of you together are just, it's like all three of you getting hit by lightning on the same day. He goes, it's just that rare. And that's what started me asking questions of who else has this. The results were shocking. He found 15 of his high school friends also with rare cancers. Then he took to Facebook, and that number skyrocketed to 65. Last week, he told his story on national news, and he's now at 80. The only connection between all of them, they were all at Colonia High School in Woodbridge Township from the 70s to late 90s. Many, including his sister, died of their disease. What's even more concerning is the number of teachers and staff affected. They don't live there. They work in the school. They go home to different parts of the state. And I said, that's telling that all these people who only work in the high school are also affected means there's more to this story. When he started digging further, many of these people told him how they had what doctors called curious cancers, telling him. I had this cancer that the doctor said they've never seen before. Super rare or only people that were exposed to nuclear radiation as a child living next to a power plant that was contaminating their water have this. One individual said they were told they've only seen this cancer in Agent Orange victims from Vietnam War. And I said, how are all these curiosities coming to me? And the only common denominator is Colonia High School. Lupiano spent his career in environmental science testing ground samples for toxins, so he knew that a test of the grounds around the high school could reveal a possible hazard. He reached out to Woodbridge Mayor John McCormick for help. Started a conversation with him and then involved uh, Dr. Massimino here with the school district. Um, we, we took it serious enough based on the numbers he had. Uh, we knew we had to go help him get to the next level because we as public officials can get to the state and federal governments easier than a, a citizen. So we hooked up conversations with the Department of Health and the Department of Environmental Protection and also something called the Agency for Toxic Substance Disease Registry. He's asking the EPA for a full federal and state investigation of the land around the high school. There's concern there could be radiation somewhere on the property, something Lupiano discussed with the oncologist. So he says, when you start seeing stuff like this, as a neuroscientist, he says, we look at environmental factors. And I said, I know from 20 years in this field, they've really only determined one environmental factor that increases brain tumors, and that's ionizing radiation. And he said, bingo. What's more concerning, a rock was discovered in a Colonia science classroom that was radioactive. It was donated in the 70s and removed in the late 90s, consistent with the dates of those with cancer. Do you believe that rock could be the culprit here? Or is that too simple of an answer considering the, the rare cancers that have come up now? The rock was reported as high-grade uranium ore. And I couldn't wrap my head around where does a rock like this come from? How does it wind up in a school? I kept seeing references to a secret World War II laboratory about 10, 11 miles away as the crow flies called the Middlesex Sampling Plant. That plant was involved in the development of the nuclear bombs that were used during World War II. And it was part of the Manhattan Project. His further research found that contaminated soil had been removed from that plant, some used as construction fill, right around the time that Colonia High School was built. It's possible that soil could be underneath the high school right now. New Jersey's Department of Health confirmed it's been in touch with the mayor and Lupiano and will work with federal agencies if an investigation is deemed necessary. Spring break starts for Colonia students in about two weeks. Lupiano says that's the perfect time to come out and test these grounds uninterrupted. In Colonia, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. And that investigation, just another added to the long list of work for the public health system. Advocates say the sector has been underinvested for years. The COVID crisis laid those weaknesses bare. And it's not over yet. 754 new cases reported today, two more deaths. Now a group of health leaders and private funders have a plan to address the problem by creating the state's first ever public health institute, fueled by momentum from the pandemic and a significant pot of seed money. Healthcare writer Lilo Stainton reported on the plan and joins me now with the latest. 
Lilo, it is great to be back with you. Let's talk about your latest reporting. This is an issue that has been talked about for years. It seems it took a crisis to really spur action for this. Yeah, nice to have you back, Bree. Um, it, and that's exactly it. Um, you know, it's one of the few things. There are more people at the table this time. Um, advocates for for a public health institute say, um, you know, there is some seed money, but it's really the sense that the COVID pandemic exposed so many, you know, things that were truths and known to the public health community, but weren't necessarily known by sort of the wider world, right? Like the role of contact tracers, the need to be able to set up a, a testing site or a vaccine site quickly. These are things that public health professionals do for a living, kind of. But, you know, when they do it well, we don't see it, right? There isn't an outbreak, which is not to say that they're in any way at fault for COVID, but it's just when you have a, a disease managed, that means public health is working. And, you you know, we, with COVID, we we learned all these things about what we're missing in the system. You know, the lack of the lack of redundancy, the lack of data collection. We learned about how inequities are played out and magnified. Um, you know, when it comes to race and economic differences, um, and all these things are on the radar of public health professionals. Well, let me all stop the you there. Is that something that they feel could be gained by having a public health institute rather than this, I guess, piecemeal operation we've seen from local? health departments, which did a good job given what they had to work with. Right. And I think um, they did say, to be clear, that, you know, all these public health professionals say local input is critical. But what they sometimes miss is a sort of statewide advocate who, you know, an entity that is flexible and can scale up quickly. For example, in Virginia, there's a public health institute when Fairfax County um, needed contact tracing. They talked to the institute and, you know, helped hire close to 100 people quickly and 600 people over time. It's things that government can't necessarily do as well um, or as quickly. Um, it, it also involves the ability to go out and get funding from other sources, be it foundations or get government grants. A lot of grants are now open to nonprofits. So that's another role the, the Institute could play. Very quickly before we go, talk to me about that funding. Where does it stand? Yeah. How much seed money is this going to need? Robert Wood Johnson Foundation put up 250000 to sort of get it started, but that's really part of about a million dollars, up to a million dollars they've committed. And the hope is that it would then be able to go out and get other resources from other, you know, to become an institute. That's sort of for the incubator stage. So that's the first step. All right. Tireless reporting, as always, by okay. Lilo Stainton. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bree. Turning now to the latest in Ukraine as Russia's war effort enters a second month and horrific new images emerge of dead civilians who appear to have been killed deliberately, shot at close range, some with their hands tied behind their backs. According to Ukrainian officials, it's just the latest in mounting evidence of alleged Russian atrocities. The bodies are being discovered on the streets of towns surrounding the capital, Kiev, as Russian forces retreat. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky calling it, quote, genocide, desperately pleading for more support from the U.S. and other Western allies. Global outrage is building. European allies are condemning the bloodshed. President Biden today calling for a war crimes trial against Russian President Vladimir Putin, vowing to increase sanctions against Moscow. Well, meantime, today marks the first hurdle in Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown Jackson's confirmation process. The Senate Judiciary Committee is expected to vote to move her nomination forward. Jackson is a judge on the D.C. Federal Court of Appeals and is expected to be confirmed by the full Senate later this week, where all 50 Democrats and one Republican say they'll vote in favor. If confirmed, she'll make history as the first black woman to sit on the Supreme Court in its more than 230-year history. But she won't join the bench until this summer after Justice Stephen Breyer's retirement. And at age 51, she could serve on the court for decades. Well, it's back to the campaign trail for Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill, officially launching her re-election campaign at a rally this weekend in West Caldwell. Sherrill served two terms in New Jersey's competitive 11th district. Her seed is just one of a handful being targeted by Republicans. Senior political correspondent David Cruz takes a look at whether candidates and campaign managers will be putting less weight on pre-election polling this cycle partly because some pollsters say they no longer plan to do it. Collecting public opinion is becoming more difficult 
and inaccurate. The snapshot was wrong. I mean, uh, I, you know, we have to uh, own up to that. That's Patrick Murray, the director of the Monmouth University poll, which up to now has had a fairly good record of reflecting what voters are thinking, except on election night in 2021. Past 1130 on election night, Michael, this is not what we expected. It is not what anybody expected. But Murray, whose poll had incumbent Phil Murphy up by 11 points, wasn't the only one off. Stockton and Rutgers Eagleton also missed the mark. In the weeks and months after election season, some pollsters have had to take a hard look at how they did their polling and whether it was actually serving the public. Stockton University poll director John Frungen says polling has gotten harder nowadays. People don't answer the phone anymore. Response rates have plummeted. Uh, it's getting harder, it's taking longer, and it's frankly getting more expensive to do polling. So it's partly bang for the buck that prompted Stockton to get out of the candidate versus candidate polling business. We're going to concentrate on issue polls. And we're confident about that because research has shown this problem with election polls where some voters don't participate, that doesn't translate into issue polls. Also, nobody trusts pollsters anymore. I mean, we haven't polled on that, but the general consensus is that Republicans are not into pollsters and that minorities and non-cell users are getting either undercounted or overcounted. They thought that they had... Uh, factored in the Trump damage to polling after the 2016 election. And then it, and they, they decided that they were going to um, factor in educational background and they were going to up the number of people who didn't have uh, college degrees and that that was going to fix it. And it turned out that that didn't fix it. So every time they think that they've got it, they don't. Welcome to my world, says Chris Russell, political consultant for the Chitterelli campaign last year. The polls had his guy down by double digits in the days before Election Day. Russell says it's easy to say, oh, we goofed now. But the reality is these polls do have an impact on the voters, right? They, they, they poison the atmosphere. And certainly for Jack last year, we dealt with a lot of people from donors to voters saying, ah, you know, you're, I like you, but you don't have a chance. And that was driven by public polling. So what's a pollster to do in this environment? They're really condemned if they do and then condemned when they don't. Frungen says he's actually optimistic about the future of polling, counting on voters volunteering to take polls. We call mostly cell phones. So if we don't get a response on the cell phone, she'll text a link to the poll to that cell phone. And we're finding that people will go on the phone and take the poll. And we're getting more responses that way. But ultimately, all of us need to do our own research and poll ourselves on what we actually know. You shouldn't trust the campaign's poll either necessarily. I'm not saying that some, some campaigns, wink nod, might lie a little bit about what their numbers say. Um, but ultimately, you know, I think to your point, people should spend some more time talking to their neighbors and talking to other people. And same thing with the media. Yeah, we may all rely on the horse races a little bit much, but a poll that looks at serious issues in a serious way lacks the kind of heat that most voters have come to expect from the folks who put the poll in polls. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. The U.S. House voted Friday to decriminalize marijuana at the federal level with a slim bipartisan approval. The vote was 220 to 204, with three Republicans joining Democrats in the vote. Catching up to the 19 states, including New Jersey, where recreational marijuana is already legal. The question is, will the bill die in the Senate? Supporters say it's unlikely to get the 60 votes needed to pass in that chamber. If approved, the Democratic legislation would remove marijuana from the federal controlled substances list, expunge convictions for certain cannabis-related crimes, and impose a sales tax on products that's meant to help communities harmed by marijuana prohibition. Okay, you've got exactly one month to begin stockpiling your collection of reusable bags. The statewide plastic bag ban goes into effect May 4th and is being called the strictest in the nation. But as Raymond Santana reports in our Spotlight on Business, there are a few loopholes. 
come May, you'll have to make sure you have a reusable bag when you check out at any food or retail stores in Jersey. That's because a statewide ban is going into effect May 4th on single-use plastic bags as well as polystyrene foam takeout food containers and other polystyrene products like plates, cups, food trays, and utensils. Advocacy campaign manager for Clean Ocean Action, Kari Martin, says it's all in an effort to protect our environment and Jersey from the harm of plastics pollution. Our beach sweeps results were just released for last year and there were over 9,300 plastic bags found on beaches um, in New Jersey. So that was two, a two-day event, three hours each day um, by uh, a few, you know, some thousands of volunteers. However, that's just a snippet of what plastic bags, you know, and other garbage, of course, are finding in our environment. Martin says the law does have exceptions. Anything, any bags that, you know, are used to contain meat or fish, um, or to package loose items such as bulk foods um, from the you know, bulk food aisle, um, bags used for containing live animals and, so, you know, getting that fish at the fish store and things like that. So, and also dry cleaning bags, uh, laundry bags, uh, garment bags, as well as new newspaper bags. The ban is not new to everyone. Some towns like Lambertville and Ridgewood have already implemented a ban on single use plastic bags and say education is key to a successful transition. The public has been very receptive uh, from the gate. Everyone transitioned seamlessly to utilizing paper bags and more importantly, um, the use of reusable bags. I think for the businesses, one of the challenges was understanding what the alternatives were to single use plastics that we had banned. Um, plastic straws, polystyrene, styrofoam, and um, plastic bags. And one of the things that we did to help with that was hold a sustainable business forum where some of the leaders in the community who had already implemented sustainable business practices spoke as well as um, representatives from the Environmental Commission and shared with businesses um, what alternatives they have to single-use plastics. Yu Kai Huang is the lead author of a study by the University of Georgia. He says while the law has good intentions, the study discovered an offsetting effect of eliminating single-use plastic bags. So they, they switched their demand from regulated uh, grocery plastic bag to unregulated uh, trash bag. So uh, the study identified that, okay, this type of grocery bag regulation can increase the, um, the trash bag sales. Raymond Cantor is the vice president of the Government Affairs for New Jersey Business and Industry Association, who has opposed the ban, claiming the law doesn't fully recognize the complexities of the food business. To create a situation where it's less convenient to do retail shopping than maybe it would be to do things uh, online. It's every food truck, it's every school, it's every hospital, you know, that has a cafeteria. So, you know, um, it's every supermarket that serves, you know, fresh food, you know, or, or takeout food. So there are thousands upon thousands of, of thousands of businesses that are gonna have to comply with this. As the state gears up to implement the law, the New Jersey Clean Communities Council and Department of Environmental Protection have launched websites to offer guidance to help the public and businesses transition. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. All right, and let's take a look at how stocks fared today on Wall Street. Support for the Business Report provided by the Chamber of Commerce, Southern New Jersey. Working for economic prosperity by uniting business and community leaders for more than 150 years. Membership and event information online at chambersnj.com. And that does it for us tonight, but head over to njspotlightnews.org and check us out on our social platforms where we keep you updated with all the latest news on the Garden State. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Thanks for being with us tonight. We will see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years and by the PSEG Foundation. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. 
But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the social service and nonprofit pioneers who lend a helping hand. Science and technology innovators. The men and women who provide our skilled labor. And our homegrown champions. The people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM. We've got New Jersey covered. If you need to see a doctor, RWJ Barnabas Health has two easy ways to do it from anywhere. You can see an urgent care provider 24-7 on any device with our Telemed app. Or use our website to book a virtual visit with an RWJ Barnabas Health Medical Group provider or specialist, even as a new patient. You've taken every precaution, and so have we. So don't delay your care any longer. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member. Our future relies on more than clean energy. Our future relies on empowered communities, the health and safety of our families and neighbors, of our schools and streets. The PSEG Foundation is committed to sustainability, equity, and economic empowerment. Investing in parks, helping towns go green, supporting civic centers, scholarships, and workforce development that strengthen our community.